the off ramp from 45 leading to Palmer Lane. Uh, several cars are up there on the upper part. Uh, you can see a fleet of tow trucks that have now come up and they're detangling, literally having to pull the, the vehicles apart that are up there. There's a red truck right now that's being pulled and you can still see a, a small white sedan that is uh, attached to the back end to the side of that uh, pickup truck that's being uh, pulled along. Uh, it, it is a very slow process that's going on, a very dangerous process for the emergency crews that are up there. We've been noticing that they have been taking up a, a sandy mixture, uh, spreading that up with buckets so they could keep their footing and walk up, uh, up along that line. If you look to the very back of uh, that mass of cars on that off ramp is a white pickup truck. Uh, a couple of minutes ago, I spoke to the driver of that truck. He said that he stopped just short of this pileup. He said it was a frightening scene. He said that one individual uh, spun out in front of him. A woman, after hitting the, the side walls, she got out of the car and started waving people down, trying to warn them. Something extremely dangerous. He said it was frightening. He thought that she was going to hit her. He thought other people were going to hit her. And of course, all the people that were caught up in this pileup over here. Wow, we just saw a, a, a bright. And there's the thunder bright fly, flash of lightning. That's that uh, lightning that Zach was talking about. Uh, so we've got multiple dangers going on up here, especially for those that are up there on top of the, uh, the off ramp right now. But this area is definitely uh, a place to avoid and all uh, consider all elevated roadways to be frozen. Just go ahead and just make that assumption right now. We'll keep you up to date. Back to you in the studio. There goes another one. Oh! Boom! For many of us, this is a career event. Um, you know, many of us have been in this profession for a very long time. We train for this type of a scenario, but you never really expect it to happen. Oh, he's gonna crash into them. Holy, holy. Oh! Even for the first responders here, walking is treacherous. It's prison story family salute, y'all. It's your boy Tim Snow. And uh, man, we just got some tragic, tragic news here. They said probably at least 20 people have passed away in the last day or two from this cold weather in Galveston, y'all. We had 90% of the people on the island without power. People were sleeping in their cars, running out of gas. We lost power ourselves. Thank God I have a generator, so me and my baby girl are safe. We're warm. Uh, thank you, everybody, for your thoughts, your wishes. Just please pray for Gallison. They said it's literally so bad that the morgue had to order in an extra refrigerated truck because they don't have enough room for everybody here, y'all. I know the people up north probably think we're crazy, but we're just not used to, it, used to this. My house is barely even insulated, if at all. It's kind of rough. So just hold the snow from outside. There's an ice cube next to it. See how it's pooling and melting?
it smells really bad. It's a, oh, it's like burning chemical smells. This thing is not dripping at all. It's just disappearing. Nothing. Oh, fuck, I can't hardly do that. Oh, it's really bad. You can't even let it burn for too long. This isn't snow. This is something else. Okay. It's burning off some chemical. Yeah, it's like... Because look at the flame. It gets bigger. It's yeah, bad. holy shit. It's burning some type of chemical. Ooh, oh, I guess it works. Yeah, there's something there's mixed something into in it. There's something in it. It's like it's giving some kind of fume or something. Right. Because some of this is still kind of wet. See right down there? Mm -hmm. That one is. It's kind of like moist. But nothing is dripping down still. There should be something there's nothing, pulling down there. Nothing. And it, it should has have a been. terrible chemical on Whatever this is, it's like, it's going to get into everything. Let's check on today's weather now. And Tony, something strange going on in the skies of southern Queensland in the past day. Good afternoon, Katrina. Yes, we've started seeing some mysterious echoes appearing on the radar. Now, they started late yesterday afternoon over the Darling Downs with trails of blue sweeping across the southeast during the evening and overnight before it all dissipated early this morning. So, what is it? Well, it's not weather related. Skies were clear last night and there was no rain recorded anywhere. Now, one theory is that it's a thing called chaff, small metal or plastic fibres released into the air to help shield military aircraft from radar detection during exercises. No one has confirmed that but these streams here are consistent with something being released in the upper atmosphere over the downs then being swept across the southeast by strong winds. Interesting nonetheless. Today, mostly sunny skies, no mysterious radar signals. Ipswich, Greenbank and Canungra pushed up to 30 degrees with 31 at Gatton and Beaudesert. Katrina, I'll be back soon. With you. <laughs>
control. Advanced cloud seeding. Massive ionospheric heaters. Storm absorbing super gels. Nanoscale weather machines, some barely visible to the human eye. All of these technologies exist in some form today, and many of them are being tested at this very moment. Whether we like it or not, the atmosphere is being modified by human activity. So we are living with it. We must do something about it. We don't have any alternative. In many parts of the world, large-scale weather modification is already commonplace, and with good reason. If you've experienced something like this, you'll take all the help you can get. modification programs dating back 40 years cloud seeding is the oldest and simplest weather modification technology all clouds are made up of some form of water vapor for raindrops or snow to form a tiny impurity called a condensation nucleus must be present but in nature they're rare cloud seeders use airplanes to inject impurities into the clouds the water vapor forms droplets around these nuclei eventually growing 100 times bigger big enough for gravity to pull them from the sky in a standard seeding scenario the cloud bottom plane flies below the base of the cloud and releases silver iodide particles into the warm rising updraft the cloud top plane pierces the cloud core and drops dry ice directly into the supercooled vapor region at high altitude. This is Tad Delsing. He'll be one of the pilots flying out for today's seating run. It's his job to prepare the plane for what might be a rough ride today. Along with typical fueling and flight check tasks, Delsing also needs to fill the silver iodide seating tanks. Then he'll wait for Geiger's call. Cloud seeding pilots are not typical fair weather flyers. They spend every day penetrating weather normal pilots avoid. Unfortunately, during this type of job, you, you're going to have some encounters no matter how careful you are. Pilot Kyle Spencer will be flying the cloud top plane today. He's had his share of frightening experiences. Been struck by lightning uh, numerous times. Most of the time, the lightning will just hit, like, the wingtip of the aircraft. The Cloud Warrior's worst nightmare? Getting too close to the enemy. Um, my very first season, a hailstone came right through the windshield of my airplane and, and just grazed me on the neck and ended up in the back seat. Still about a baseball-sized hailstone laying in the back seat of the airplane. <laughs> back in his office, Geiger's making his final decisions about today's seating flights. Anything that deals with weather forecasting or just the general environment out there, you do have to have a little bit of luck and art and, uh, and some science, of course. Uh, it's more observation, getting an idea of your gut feeling for what that storm may do later on as it continues to mature and grow. Geiger is surveying his target area for a specific type of cloud, one that's large enough to contain a supercooled region where water vapor is just waiting to freeze and grow into ice crystals, which later fall as rain. A front of large clouds are moving into the target area. Spencer and Delsing leap into action, weather warriors scrambling into battle. All right, clear onto the runway. As Kyle heads for the high altitude cloud tops, Tad will cruise close to the ground and prepare. All right, we are airborne. Wheels coming up. What we're going to do here is we're going to pull right up under these clouds here that you can kind of see are growing a little bit on the sides. And we'll actually be running just parallel with the rain shaft coming down here to the south, trying to find our best area of inflow. Hawk 1 radar. Yes. During his flight, Walt Geiger will continue to radio Tad with updates on the cloud's position and size. Okay, I've been on it. It's at southwest, and, uh, or mostly southwest of you. And, uh, been when Delsing finds the exact location of the updraft, he'll fly directly into it. As the ride gets bumpy, he'll ignite silver iodide generators to release the agent, 
where it'll be carried thousands of feet up into the cloud. Meanwhile, Kyle Spencer prepares for the more difficult task. He'll be penetrating the body of the cloud. At this ultra-cold altitude, dry ice is a much more efficient seeding agent, forcing water vapor to freeze around it. If they hit their marks, both agents will provide a massive infusion of condensation nuclei and the raindrops will begin to build. But even after almost 30 years of cloud seeding service and some convincing results in hail suppression, there's still some question about cloud seeding's effectiveness as a whole. Scientists do generally accept that cloud seeding affects the clouds. They just can't measure or prove the results. The problem you have in showing that it works in nature is that you can't do controlled experiments. So it's very difficult to say, you know, if a seeded cloud rains, that it wouldn't have rained otherwise. Even without definitive proof, cloud seeding continues to be practiced in over 34 countries worldwide. But silver iodide and dry ice nuclei are Stone Age technologies compared to today's higher tech particle payloads. The most amazing of these belong to a family of weather mod devices that are so small you might not see one even if it was floating in your eye. Ranging from the ultra tiny to the nearly invisible, these are the revolutionary micro machines that will be the workhorses of any world weather control system. They're MEMS, micro electromechanical sensors. There are approximately 2,000 weather balloons launched globally worldwide every day. Those balloons play a huge role in helping us predict and potentially control our weather. But what if we could launch 10,000 weather balloons a day or 10 million? That's exactly the theory behind GEMS. GEMS are global environmental MEMS sensors, a concept that we have come up with that deals with a massive wireless network of airborne probes. The idea is to release 10,000 or more of these dust-sized probes every day from airplanes, stratospheric platforms, or satellites. Like weather balloons, the probes would monitor weather information over every kilometer of the Earth's surface at a resolution that is today unheard of. We envisioned that the GEMS probe itself would have a bio-inspired design something like a maple seed or a dandelion seed that actually incorporates the constructs of nature to achieve aerodynamics and buoyancy. With an ongoing stream of millions of measurements, the accuracy of our picture of the atmosphere could improve 1,000 times over. There's every reason to be optimistic that simply having more measurements of the atmosphere will lead to improved forecasts. It's also possible that the gems themselves could be made to play an active role in cloud dynamics. In effect, cloud seeding with a million microscopic computers. We could potentially use these very small devices either as cloud condensation nuclei to seed clouds the way that current weather modification is done. Or potentially something even more futuristic would be to actually have the devices be active where they could introduce some perturbation into parts of the atmosphere to actually modify the weather. But if gems are heavier than air, what will happen when these millions of probes finally fall to Earth? When the gems probes land on the surface, either in the water or on the land, they would continue potentially to provide surface observations. But what about the ones that end up on your picnic table or in your hair? At the sizes we're talking about, if you actually inhaled one or got one in your mouth or one in your eye, it would probably be no different than, say, a speck of dust or a, a particular particle in the atmosphere that you would get in. You'd probably sneeze it out or cough it up. Useful as nanotechnology will be to weather observation and prediction, there's no question that it will also play a significant role in military weather operations. And it will simply be the newest weapon in a secret arsenal dating back more than 50 years. The parallels between weather modification and the nuclear age are striking. If we can build a thing, should we? And if it's possible, is there any way to stop it?
This is the High Frequency Active Auroral Research Project, jointly managed by the Air Force Research Laboratory and the Office of Naval Research. Its stated purpose? Communications research. But many scientists worldwide, including the holder of the technology's patent, claim that this facility has another, more insidious capability. Experimental manipulation of the atmosphere to control the weather. Bernard Eastland is a plasma physicist, former fusion researcher for the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission, and inventor who has three weather control patents. Eastland's specialty is revolutionary mechanisms of energy transfer. That was exactly the reason that the Atlantic Richfield Oil Company approached him with a unique problem to solve. I was originally hired by ARCO in about 1984 to find a use of their natural gas on the north slope of Alaska. They have 23 trillion cubic feet of natural gas. To put this in perspective, that's enough gas to power the entire American electrical grid for one year. But its location was so remote, there was no economically feasible way to transport it. Dr. Eastland had been contracted with them to find a way to exploit the natural gas on the North Slope. In other words, to convert natural gas um, to money, <laughs> but first to turn it to electricity and then radio frequency energy. I came up with the idea of using the energy in the gas to make electricity and to use the electricity to power a large phased array antenna that could modify the ionosphere in different ways. Eastland's massive antenna array invention was called HARP, the High Frequency Active Auroral Research Project. The claims being made about the technology were such that I really, it was almost unbelievable. Although the HARP antenna array looks unremarkable, its capabilities are not. HARP is one of the few man-made devices capable of heating the Earth's ionosphere. The ionosphere is an enveloping layer of charged particles located 90 miles above the surface, above the atmosphere as most of us know it. The charged particles in the ionosphere perform a very important function for the planet. They deflect and absorb the solar wind, the toxic onslaught of deadly particles thrown at us by the sun. Without the ionosphere, life as we know it on Earth would perish. Eastland's plan was to pump energy derived from natural gas directly into the ionosphere. The stated goal was communications research. Arco immediately understood the genius in Eastland's idea. And thanks to his patent, they were contracted by the U.S. military to build this incredible device. It's a very good research facility. Uh, it's minuscule compared to the size of the antenna I suggested in my patents. However, it's the first piece of what could become something bigger. But even in its current incarnation, it's the largest ionospheric heater in the world, capable of heating a 400 square mile area of the ionosphere to over 50,000 degrees. It's also a phased array, which means it's steerable and it can point where it wants to point. You can make those waves go where you want. What they have found is that by sending radio frequency energy up and focusing it as they do with, with these kinds of instruments, it causes a heating effect. And that heating literally lifts the ionosphere within a 30 mile uh, diameter area. They're in changing localized pressure systems or perhaps the route of jet streams. The idea of mod moving a jet stream is a phenomenal um, uh, event in terms of man being able to do this. The problem is we cannot model the system adequately. Long-term consequences of ionospheric heating are unknown. Changing weather in one place can have a devastating downstream effect. And HARP has already been accused of modifying the weather. A year 2000 article in Scientific American pointed out that a strange shift in the jet stream directly over Gakona, Alaska pushed colder air southward, causing a rare tornado outbreak in Florida. As a weapon of war, HARP's possible uses are daunting.